Last fall, 17,000 vials of a steroid were shipped to clinics and hospitals in 23 states. The drug had to be sterile because patients would have it injected into their joints or their spines to relieve chronic pain. What happened next is the worst pharmaceutical disaster in decades. The steroid was contaminated with fungus. 48 people have been killed. 720 are being treated for persistent fungal infections. The tragedy has exposed a failure in drug safety. And in a moment, you will hear the commissioner of the FDA acknowledge that she can no longer guarantee the safety of many high-risk drugs. The steroid was produced by New England Compounding Center. And in the six months since the first deaths, no one at New England Compounding has revealed what happened. But tonight, they will. As for the victims, this has been an unrelenting horror after just one injection of lethal medicine. The story will continue in a moment. I've been in the hospital seven times, um, total of 75 days. I've missed Thanksgiving and Christmas and my son's birthday. Julie Otto is one of 13 injured patients who met us at St. Joseph Mercy Hospital outside Detroit. I'm on 60 milligrams of morphine a day with uh, no cure in sight. There is no cure in sight for me. Willard Mazur's morphine is to kill the pain from the fungal infection. We asked the patients to sit down in the first two rows, and many of them brought family to the auditorium. Michigan is a hot spot for the toxic steroid, one of 23 states that received the drug from Massachusetts. St. Joseph Mercy has treated 189 patients, all of whom endure brutal antifungal drugs. The medicine is just unbearable. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, they talk about cancer treatments, and I'm sure they're unbearable too, but this is some unbearable stuff. This is the fungus. It is a sample that has been grown from the spinal fluid of a patient. The fungus is a form of mold that attacks bone and nerves. The patients who had it injected in the spine have an infection called meningitis, which can also reach the brain. Have the doctors told any of you that the fungus is gone and you never have to worry about it again? Yeah. 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 The steroid, methylprednisolone acetate, made by New England Compounding Center, known as NECC, came from this industrial park near Boston, which houses the pharmacy and an outfit that recycles construction debris both owned by the family of Barry Cadden, a pharmacist and president of NECC. Cadden's New England Compounding Center was what's known as a compounding pharmacy. By law, compounding pharmacies are not allowed to manufacture pharmaceuticals for the mass market. That would require the oversight of the FDA. Instead, states license compounding pharmacies to make drugs for individuals. For example, a doctor might order a liquid form of a medication for a patient who can't swallow a pill. Compounding pharmacies are bound by one rule. They must have a prescription for each individual patient. But NECC was shipping tens of thousands of vials from its lab called Clean Room One. Investigators shot video inside NECC. This is the first time the public has seen it. And this is the first interview with a technician from Clean Room One. The underlying factor is, is that uh, the company got greedy and overextended and we got sloppy and something happened. Joe Conley started in Clean Room One in 2009. He remembers in 2011 a salesman came by with a boast and a warning. He was walking through and says, oh, I got, I got a bunch of stuff coming for you guys. You guys are going to be busy. You guys, I'm going to keep you guys moving. And that just meant compound it, process it, get it out the door. Conley says over months, the lab was overwhelmed with orders. Output of drugs that he made increased by a factor of 1,000. We became a manufacturer overnight. So we were basically had, trying to have the best of both worlds. We was trying to manufacture without the oversight of a manufacturer. And it, it was just, we all got overtaxed, everything. 
which made it harder, he says, to follow the strict procedures that kept drug preparation sterile. They would occasionally find mold in the clean room? Occasionally, yes. How often? I would say maybe a dozen times in three years we would find it. He told us they would clean up and keep moving, but a month before the first steroid death, he says he warned his supervisor. Something's going to happen, something's going to get missed, and we're going to get shut down. What did you mean by that? We were going to hurt a patient. Uh, we were just thinking hurt a patient. Um, we weren't compounding anymore. We were manufacturing. When you went to your supervisor and told him that, mm -hmm. he said what? That's verbatim. <laughs> he shrugged. Uh, that was his response for a lot of our questions or comments or concerns. It was a shrug. Meaning? Just do it. Uh, he, either he didn't care or he was powerless to, to change it. NECC was growing explosively and so was the compounding industry. It started in 1998 when Congress exempted compounding pharmacies from the oversight of the Food and Drug Administration. The theory was mixing drugs one prescription at a time shouldn't require federal inspection. The law passed over the strong objections of then FDA Commissioner David Kessler. You as FDA Commissioner testified before them and you said don't do this. If you're not going to have oversight, one day people are going to die. That day's arrived. This should not happen in 2013. Maybe at the turn of the previous century, where we didn't have institutions like the FDA, there is no reason why people had to die. Without FDA supervision, compounding took off. State health departments are responsible for regulating what is now nearly a $2 billion industry. Dr. Margaret Hamburg is FDA commissioner now, and she told us because of the 1998 law, she doesn't know how many compounders there are or what they're making. You know, I can just hear the folks at home saying, wait a minute, I thought every pharmaceutical drug in this country was approved by the FDA, and you seem to be telling me in this interview that that's not the case. Well, compounded drugs are not FDA approved. So if a patient goes into a clinic and the doctor or the nurse pulls out a vial of something, that patient has no way to know whether that drug has been approved by the FDA or not. Well, I think that's right under the current system. And what I think emerged in the meningitis outbreak was that many patients and their health care providers didn't realize that they, in fact, were using a compounded product. As commissioner of the FDA, then, you can't tell us sitting here now that every drug being used in the United States is safe and effective. No, I, I really cannot. It was up to the Massachusetts Board of Pharmacy to inspect NECC. Records show occasional problems with sterility, but the pharmacy passed a board inspection in 2011. Still, there is no indication that the state fully realized how big and dangerous NECC had become. This is an NECC salesman speaking for the first time, and we were surprised when he told us how many hospitals and clinics were clients. Close to 3,000, I'd say. 3,000 clients all across the country. Yep. The salesman asked us to disguise him and not use his name. He fears the connection to NECC will ruin his career. He left NECC a year before the steroid disaster. He says he was replaced by a competing salesman. He told us that many of NECC's clients were in on the fraud at the heart of the company's growth. The law required NECC to have a name on a prescription, so clinics provided names, any names. Bart Simpson, Homer Simpson, that we, those ones did raise red flags and we told to call our client back and say, hey, give us different names and follow up names would be like a John Doe, Jane Doe, Bill Doe you know, Jane Smith, Bill Smith, etc. These weren't real people. As far as I know, I mean, how many Jane Doe's and John Doe's do you know? I mean... And when you got the prescriptions with Bart Simpson's name and Homer Simpson's name, you I, went back to that client and said what? Can you please, you know, give us legitimate names or people that you know? Sometimes they take a, a phone directory within their office and scribble out their extensions, fax it over to us. It's obvious what was going on. It was obvious to them. 
yeah. that this wasn't above board. Right. I mean, if, if you're in your position, if you're a, a, a buyer and your jobs save money and you're going to get a brand name for $40 and we offer you a $20 vial for the same drug, same size, same everything, what are you going to do? You're going to go and get two for the price of one using us. So they, most of them knew that. I mean, some of them wouldn't do business with us. The ones that we didn't have as clients are the ones that knew, hey, you guys can't be doing this. You're not doing it right. And we'd run into that a lot. But we move on to the next one. There's more big fish out there. Big fish kept a big sales team busy. But the salesman told us Barry Cadden, the president, hid that fact during state inspections. So Barry would notify the managers of the sales team, hey, don't let the sales team either come in today or if they're already in the building, don't let them leave. If the FDA went upstairs or the Board of Pharmacy went up there and saw 30 sales reps making phone calls, 100 calls a day, they'd wonder what was going on and why are you so big when you're supposed to be a mom and pop specialty pharmacy and you're not. That sales force sold methylprednisolone to a pain clinic in Michigan which treated George Carey's wife and Anita Baxter's mother. Lillian Carey and Karina Baxter were among the first to die. We've pulled together pictures of about half of the 48 dead. The most recent fatality was last month. Death often comes when the fungus reaches the brain. By the time the hospital determined that she had uh, suffered a stroke, um, it was too late. Same thing. She died five days later. Lillian Carey died before doctors figured out what was happening. So while she was in the hospital, her husband George decided to do something about a nagging pain in his back. He went to the same clinic she had, and now the fungus is in him too. What has the treatment been like? You're not able to, f to function. You're not able to concentrate. Um, you, you, the staff called us the walking zombies. On September 26th, after patients started dying, state officials came to inspect NECC. What happened that day? We were told that we're being inspected, so everybody stop what you're doing and just start cleaning. So you started cleaning the clean room? Yeah. Now, at this point, there is a federal investigation underway. I did, we didn't know that. You didn't know that, but the company knew that. I would assume, yeah. The prosecutor investigating this case might consider that to be obstruction of justice. I would very much agree. The evidence was getting cleaned up. It seemed like it. Despite the cleanup, the FDA tested 50 leftover vials of methylprednisolone and all were contaminated. They noted that the intake for NECC's ventilation was 100 feet from the recycling plant. And nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Barry Cadden, New England Compounding's founder, was subpoenaed by Congress. I respectfully decline to answer on the basis of my constitutional rights and privileges, including the Fifth Amendment to the United States Constitution. Wonder what you would say to him today. I'd hope it'd be through bars. Yeah. Whatever I said to him, I hope it'd be through bars. Mm -hmm. After this interview, Willard Mazur lost feeling in both legs. He's back in the hospital, and so is George Carey. Margaret Hamburg, Commissioner of the FDA, now wants Congress to return authority over compounding pharmacies to her agency. We need clear, strong, consistent federal standards that will be applied across the board, all 50 states. Um, we need to be able to go in and inspect these facilities and get access to all of the information that we need. What are the chances of this happening again? I'm sad to say that if we do not put in place the comprehensive legislation that really defines roles and responsibilities, we will have other similar problems. Barry Cadden and others are targets of a criminal investigation. Cadden declined to be interviewed. His lawyer told us that Cadden is saddened by all of this but does not know how the drug was contaminated. NECC has gone into bankruptcy and we noticed in the court papers that Cadden and his partners withdrew $16 million from the company over the last year, some of it as people were beginning to die.